So we're continuing this evening our study in the book of Jonah. I'd like to turn to Jonah chapter 1, please. We're almost through with chapter 1. We have some more discussion that I want us to do on chapter 1 yet this evening before we move into chapter 2. And the story of Jonah, of course, is this uh, message in which God is teaching Jonah how God cares for the souls of all people. He wants them to hear the gospel and uh, have the hope of eternal life, salvation, and so on. And in particular, he wants them to go to Nineveh. But Nineveh is uh, uh, Syria, the enemies. And so Jonah doesn't want to go. So God is teaching him his, God's concern his care for all people. So the first chapter, Jonah flees. The second chapter, we'll see tonight, Jonah prays to God. Uh, the third chapter, he goes to Nineveh and preaches. In the fourth chapter, he learns that God wants everybody to be saved. So in chapter uh, 1 yesterday, we discussed the flight of Jonah, how that God told him uh, to go uh, up here to Nineveh. If this will work. Oh, here we go. Up here to Nineveh. And Jonah's down here in gath just near, not too far from the Sea of Galilee. God wants him to go up here and preach to Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to do it, so instead he goes down to Joppa, the opposite direction, and goes across the Mediterranean Sea. So, we discussed some aspects of the subject last time. Uh, what happened? Just by way of review, what happened when Jonah tried to flee? Where did he go, and uh, what was the result? Frank. He was going to uh, Tarshish, which is what we know of as southern Spain. Okay, so he's going west across the Mediterranean Sea to Spain, Tarshish, and what happens is he's going. It, it, of course, we talked about the fact that he's trying to escape. He doesn't want to do what God told him to do. What happens is he goes. Rick. God brought a great storm upon the sea. Okay, very severe storm, uh, and the ship's about to sink. So what do the sailors do about it? Neil? They start throwing the um, material that they were taking to Tarshish. They started throwing it overboard to lighten the load on the ship, and that didn't help matters any. So they found Jonah sleeping in the bottom of the ship and asked him how could he be sleeping with this great storm. Okay. So first they try to survive, uh, for the ship to survive, and uh, then they're praying to their gods, the various different gods, and they want, uh, Jonah's not, he's asleep, he's not praying, so they wake him up, try to get him to pray to his god, uh, and problems continue, so then what? What happens as they continue with the storm? Okay, so they cast lots to find out who's, the respo who's responsible for the problem. Turns out to be Jonah, of course, and so he tells them he's fleeing from his God. His God is the God of uh, the Hebrews and uh, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so they ask, well, what they should they do about it, and what's his solution? Throw him over. Because the ship is in trouble because of him. Uh, so if they throw him overboard, then he will uh, presumably drown but the people in the ship, they're innocent, they'll be saved. They try to save the ship anyway, can't, and so they throw him overboard. And that's where we were pretty much at the end of our study last time. Uh, so as by way of review then, we see that God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, but he didn't want to, he fled. Uh, there's a storm, the sailors pray and try to find the, cause the problem, it's Jonah. And he says to throw him overboard, so they do. And that the last part of the, uh, story, a verse, a chapter rather, he swallowed by this fish, which we'll talk some more about that tonight. So there was a couple of things I wanted to do, and then a little bit of, uh, a couple more questions on the first chapter, a couple of comments that I thought were pretty interesting from some people uh, that I've read in studying on this. Uh, one uh, commentator said, when God enjoins a disagreeable duty, it is far easier to go and do it than to run away from it. I think that's an interesting point. At least to me it is. Uh, we think, well, I'll, I'll avo if, avoid the problem, I'll, but you end up causing more problems for yourself and everybody else when you try to avoid what God tells you to do than the problems you'd have if you did it. And then there's this one. 
When one sets out to baffle God, there's bound to be a storm. Some interesting thoughts in it. Jonah, I think, is a book that's easy to make good observations on. It's an interesting story. Okay, anything else on last week's lesson, anybody? All right. So, a couple more questions. Uh, on chapter 1, 29 and 30, uh, I ask you to list some ways that people today attempt to evade their responsibilities. Now, Jonah tried to flee, but there are other ways that people try to avoid responsibilities. Um, and some scriptures, too. Question number 30, scriptures, passages about hiding or attempting to escape. So what did you come up with on that? What are some scriptures that you had, or what are some passages, uh, some uh, examples of people trying to hide from God, escape from God, and so on? Steve? Uh, Genesis 3 and verse 8. Uh, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Okay, so that's one of the first ones we would probably think of, isn't it? Uh, people hiding from God, Adam and Eve, in the garden, trying to hide from God. Okay, other examples or ways today, Rick? I look at it as if you know your brother is doing something wrong, you know his soul is in jeopardy and you placate him instead of trying to make things right or to get him to do right then you're running away just like Jonah ran away. Okay, so it's easy for us to criticize Jonah, isn't it? But what about people we know who need to be told the gospel and Maybe we're the ones in the best position to talk to them about it. Do we fulfill our responsibility or do we hide from our responsibility? Other examples or passages? Other ways that people try to evade responsibility? Other passages? Anybody? Uh, Terry? Hebrews 4.13 and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All right, so you can't hide from God. There's no, no matter how you try to do it, you can't hide from God because he knows everything. You see, what happens is we, we grow up as kids, we try to hide from our parents, try to prevent them, and I, I know I did it, and I suspect most of us did it, Keep our parents from finding out. If they don't find out, I'm okay. You know. And sometimes we get away with it. Um, but you can't get away with it with God. Uh, there's no escaping God because he knows everything. Okay. Other examples or other scriptures? Steve. In Psalms of 139, 7 and 8, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Okay, so again, God sees everything, he knows everything, you can't escape. Doesn't matter where you where you try to go. All right, uh, here are some passages, some examples that I gave of how people try to escape responsibility. One is to, sometimes we people try to avoid spiritual situations. What I mean by that is they try to avoid being around people or church assemblies or whatever that remind them of the wrongs that they're doing. Uh, they don't want to be around certain members of the church or elders or preachers or whatever because it makes them feel guilty. So they just try to stay away. And a lot of times they quit attending church meetings and so on because of their guilt or whatever. Uh, so that's uh, an example. And then uh, so they do things in the dark. Uh, people will uh, commit crimes at night where they hope nobody will see them. Uh, or they try to hide the evidence. You know, you've, you've heard the, or have read the murder mysteries where the movies are, you, you gotta hide the body, you know, hide the murder weapon. Hide the evidence so that they can't. But it doesn't work, these things don't work with God. You lie about it, deceive, try to uh, deny that you did it. But none of these things may work with people, but they never work with God. Uh, and then of course there's the blaming other people. It's, it, that wasn't my fault, it's other people's fault. All right, so it, We've got a lot of Jonas, don't we? In fact, sometimes it's us 
So we need to think seriously about some lessons we can learn from the uh, uh, story here. And then just to, to follow up on that, uh, not only are, do people try to escape responsibility, but the reason that it ends up not working is because you can't hide from yourself. You know what you did. Even if other people don't know, you know what you did. And there's, you've got a, a conscience to live with. You can't hide from God, as we've seen. Uh, and God's going to make us, uh, call us to account. We know that's going to happen. And so there's only one solution, really. And it's the one we're going to see that Jonah had to learn. That's repent. Do it God's way. That's the only solution to the problem of uh, when we're guilty because God has given us a responsibility and we haven't done it. The only solution is to repent and do things his way. Okay, so there's some lessons on the first chapter, uh, except for verse 17, which we need to look at more closely going into chapter 2. Questions or comments anybody has on the first chapter before we move on then? Anybody? All right, let's read some, starting in chapter 1, verse 17, because it ties so closely to chapter 2. Uh, well, let's go ahead and, and read all of chapter 2. We'd like to read chapter 1, verse 17, through all of chapter 2 for us, please. Chapter 1, verse 17, then all of chapter 2. We'd like to read that for us, please. Uh, Daryl, please. <clears throat> the Lord appointed great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You hear my voice. For you uh, cast me, have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. All right. So here in verse, the last verse of chapter 1, the last verse of chapter 2, we have the part of the story that skeptics, critics, have trouble with. And that is the idea. Here's a, a fish swallows a man. He lives for three days and three nights inside the fish, and then the fish spits him out on the dry land and he survives it. Um, so I ask you question 20, the last question on chapter 2, uh, to discuss and consider how could that be? We know it doesn't happen naturally. So how could, how could something like that happen in this story? So I want us to talk about it some more at the time, but uh, what is there anything you see first of all in verse 17 uh, this may be a difficult question. Anything you see in verse 17 of chapter 1 that's a, a key uh, a hint that shows why this may have been able to happen? Debbie. God prepared the fish. Thank you, Debbie. Yes. This was no ordinary fish. <laughs> in other words, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. God arranged this to teach a lesson to Jonah. So, uh, if you have problems believing it, the problem that we're having is believing in miracles. But if we believe in miracles, then why should we have problems believing in this fish that swallowed Jonah? So, it's a, it, notice that we're prepared. We're going to see that word several times before we're through with the, the story of Jonah. So, God is preparing some things to teach Jonah lessons. And the fish is the first thing he prepares. So, he's in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So let's go ahead to chapter 2, and then we'll talk some more about it when we get to the end of chapter 2, if we can. So chapter 2, then, so Jonah is in the belly of the fish, and what does he do? What's Jonah, chapter 2 now, verse 2, what's Jonah do in the belly of the fish? Pray. He prays. Okay? So he's in the fish, God prepares this fish, and he's 
Well, back up a little bit. Oh, he prays. And then he ascribes what's going on. He cries out to the Lord because of his affliction, he says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried. And I ask you what Sheol is. What's he talking about about Sheol? Sheol means what? Grave. The grave. It can mean either the physical, the body, where the body goes to the grave, or it can mean where our spirits go after death. It's an Old Testament word. Uh, but was he really in Sheol, in, literally, at this point? And he wasn't, was he? He wasn't dead. So it seems to me like he's, he's it's a figure of speech. It seems like he felt like it. That's what it seemed like to him. He was so scared, it was like, and he's going down, down, down. Like he, he, would, he would think of going down into the grave and so on. Uh, and so he prays to God, and he says, God heard his voice. Okay, any other comments on verse 2? All right, so verse 3. Uh, who? What role does he say God has in this? What does he they say about God's role in this? Verse 3. Frank. He said, you have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. And uh, he's overwhelmed with the, with the sea. Okay. But notice he says that God, you cast me into the deep. Well, has it, had God, was God really the one who cast him in? Well, not really, was it? It wasn't. Sailors threw him overboard. So why did he say God did it? When he, when he knew it was the sailors who threw him overboard, why did he say God did it? Debbie? Because the lots they sent, they cast indicated generally the guilty party. Okay. So yeah, so God, basically God had showed them that that's what he told them was the one and that's what they, he wanted them to do. So he acknowledges that God's the one who's responsible for him being where he is. And of course, ultimately his sins are responsible, but God is punishing him. He sees his responsibility now that he's having problems because he hasn't done what God said that he should do. Okay. And so you cast me into the, uh, the heart of the seas. Floods surrounded me, billows and your waves passed over me. Okay. Verse 3. Comments to verse 3? Anybody else? All right, verse 4 now. What does he say? How does he, how does he, uh, how does he react? Now he knows that he's still alive. But he knows God's in charge of the situation. Uh, and so he's praying to God. And so how does he, how does he respond in verse 4? Frank. Um, he says that, um, that he's driven away from the sight of God. And uh, okay. because of his disobedience, is the reason that he's driven away from the sight of God. Yet, he says, I shall look again uh, upon your holy temple. In other words, he'll, he's ready to repent. Okay, so we see the beginning of repentance, don't we? He acknowledges that God has done this. He knows it's because of what he did that God has done this to him. Uh, he says, I've been cast out of your sight. He's He's separated from God. He sees that. He recognizes that. But he's going to look to the to God's temple, which I, I took to mean, like Frank did, that, that he's now beginning to, to turn to God. The temple is a place of worship to God. He's beginning to see he needs to come back to God. That's the solution to his problem, is to come back to God. Okay? Other comments? Through verse uh, 4. Terry. I also saw this as John recognizing the mercy of God. He sent Jonah to preach to people who were wicked so that they would repent. So he knew that God was going to have mercy on those people. Now he's in the position where he needs mercy. And he sees the only place to get that is from God. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, isn't it interesting how... When we're the ones who need the mercy, we're all in favor of mercy. 
But what it's maybe in this case Nineveh, well, he wasn't so much in favor of mercy, mercy for Nineveh. But for himself, he sure wanted it. Okay, that's an important lesson for us, isn't it? That we should want mercy for others the same as we do for ourselves. Okay, so he wants to look towards the temple. Then verse 5. How does he describe his condition? How does he, how does he feel in verse 5? What's he describe, Rick? Situation? How do you describe it? He's in a dire, dire situation to where uh, he might as well be dead. The waters are all surrounding him, and even the weeds are wrapped around his head. To, he's just in complete darkness. Okay. When I read this, I it reminded me of something in my life. Let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever dr come close to drowning? Anybody ever come close to drowning? Frank, what's it like, Frank? Do you remember when it happened? Very frightening. Yes. Okay, what happened? Oh, well, I was on an air mattress and, and the current was taking me out in the ocean. And, uh, and I was being taken out farther and farther and I really struggled. To hard to get back in where the current was taking me back in, and it was it was really frightening. Okay, Steve. What was the question? Have you ever nearly drowned? Have you experienced? Okay. Can you identify with what with what Joan is going through here and nearly drowning? Well, one reason I asked the question is because I did. When I was eight years old, I, uh, I almost drowned. And uh, I remember it just like it was yesterday. It was really two or three years ago, you know, but uh, I was, I was just, just like it was like yesterday. I was going down the third time when a neighbor pulled me out. Scary. Scary. The water just, I couldn't swim, of course. The water just feels like it keeps sucking you down. I think that's what Joan is describing here. He's just going down and down, and he's com you're completely helpless. You think you're going to die, and there's nothing you can do about it. And, it's, and I think that's what Joan is trying to describe here. Uh, the waters are surrounding him, and deep is closing, and weeds wrapping around his head. Other comments through verse 5, anybody? Okay. So now verse 6. How deep does he describe it? Of course, some of this, of course, is poetic, not necessarily literal, but how, how does he describe how far down he went in this uh, in the sea? The moorings of the mountains. The moorings of the mountains. And some of your translations may read differently from that. The moorings of the mountains or what? What does some of the others say? Bottom. What is it? Bottom of the mountains. Okay, the roots of the, the, roots mountains. Of the mountains. Okay, so the point is all the way down to the bottom of the sea. Now I don't know if he literally went that far, but it felt that way to him. Uh, of course, he's inside this fish. Um, the earth with its bars have closed behind him forever. He's convinced that he's he's he's, he's hopeless, and yet, and yet, you've brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. So all this horrible experience, he's beginning to turn to God, beginning to have hope in God, uh, and trust God. Okay, other comments through verse 6, anybody? Okay, verse 7. What you say, what you do in verse 7? His last thoughts, his last resource is that he remembers God and he recognizes prayer is his only answer, the only option. Okay, so now we see very clearly his soul is fainting, 
And he remembers the Lord. And his prayer goes to the Lord in his holy temple. So he's reached, we might say, not just physically, but spiritually. He's, he's, he's hit the bottom. And he realizes he's only got one solution. And that's to turn to the Lord in prayer. So I, I know to some extent we can't fully grasp it, but here he is in this fish down in the depths of the sea, and yet he's still alive, and he realizes his only hope is just the Lord. Now this is a man who just deliberately ran away from the Lord, remember, tried to hide and escape from the Lord. Now he realizes he needs the Lord, okay? Other comments through verse 7. Terry. I think it's interesting to consider that even though God had prepared this fish so that none could live, it was not a comfortable place to be. It wasn't uh, like um, Geppetto in, in the whale. It was not a comfortable place to be. Yes, and yes, right. It wasn't, it wasn't like a Pullman sleeper or something like that. Okay, yeah. God didn't mean this to be pleasant. He meant for it to be scary. He meant it to be punishment. He meant it to teach him a lesson. And Jonah's beginning to see the lesson. But how about verse 8? What, um, what does Jonah think about in verse 8 that he compares to what he, the solution to his problem? Steve? He won't get any relief or comfort from an idol. So he doesn't need an idol. He needs the true God. He, he knows what his problem is caused by. He knows where he needs to go. And he knows no idol is going to solve this problem. Frank? Uh, it says that the idols are worthless. They, they can't offer mercy. Only God can offer mercy. So if you're drowning in the sea, what can an idol do for you? Idols can't do anything for themselves, let alone do something to help you in a problem. So Jonah recognizes that. Um, all those sailors on the ship, you know, they were praying to their different idols, but that didn't help them. Uh, it was only one that did what the true God said, that there was a solution to their problem. So uh, he says, that if you regard worthless, or idols are worthless, if you regard them, you forsake your own mercy. What does that mean? If you turn to idols in your time of need, you're forsaking your own mercy, Rick. He's just saying that uh, those that believe in idols shouldn't it, don't know they're not going to receive any mercy. Only God can give mercy. And so you've turned away from the only true mercy you can have when you turn away from God. You turn to an idol. There's no mercy there. You've got to turn to the true God. Okay. Comments, questions, discussion, Terry? In the uh, English standard, it says they forsake their hope of steadfast love. And the thought that came to me when I was studying this is an idol cannot love you. An idol has no emotion towards you. You may have emotion towards the idol, but the idol has no emotion towards you. But God has steadfast love for his creature even when his creature has deserted him. Yes. And lots of the other prophets make that same point about idols. Idols are not alive. They, there's no life there. They not only don't give life, they don't have life. They don't have life, that they don't have the, quality, the characteristics of a living person or living being. So they only can't love you, they can't have mercy for you, they can't uh, save you. It says that God is the Savior. Uh, the one who can who can save you. The idols are worthless. God uh, can save you. Uh, verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. The Lord is the one who can save because he has power. No power in idols. No, no means to do anything. Uh, and yet people turn to them thinking that they can have saved, attained help. Anything else in verse 8? Rick. God created the whole earth. He created everything within that we know of. And 
An idol is made by man's hands. A man don't have any power. God has the power to do with his creation. Okay, and we see that again, don't we, through the power of creation. God created the worlds, and we talked about that last time when Noah tried to flee. The, the fact that uh, with an idol, you have they, their belief was that an idol has a power like in a city or a territory. If you escape, get out of their territory where they don't have power, then you can get away from them. But the God who created the heavens and the earth, there's no escaping him because he made it all. doesn't matter where he goes. He's in the bottom of the sea. God's power is down there too. doesn't matter where he goes. Uh, you can't escape him. Okay, and now then verse 9. What does Noah, uh, Jonah decide to do according to verse 9? What you going to do about his problem? He's praying. What you going to do? Verse 9. Right. He, he says that now with, with thanksgiving towards God, he will sacrifice uh, for him and obey him and pay for the, the vows that he has made, the commitment that he made to God, uh, he will fulfill. Okay. So he's, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. What's this? Well, Frank's pretty much explained this. A vow is what? What's a vow? Promise especially a sacred promise in this case a promise to God what would a prophet's promise to God be Terry to speak his word yeah teach the message spread the gospel the message the teaching a, a prophet has a, a responsibility to God to teach the message Jonah didn't want to teach the message that God told him to go Jonah has now said okay I'll pay the vow to me, that's his way of saying of re, The word repentance isn't there, but to me, that's what this is saying. Repentance. He knows he's done wrong, and he's decided, okay, I will do what's right. I, I, I'm willing to pay my vow uh, and sacrifice to you to, to do what God wanted him to do. But he says he'll do it with the voice of thanksgiving. What's the significance of that? What is he, why, in this Situation. Why would he mention Thanksgiving in his willingness to do what God told him to do? Why mention Thanksgiving? Rick? Well, if he had been through everything he just went through and was still going through, be very, very thankful that you had a way of escape. You had a God that could save you. <clears throat> Okay, and so he says, salvation is of the Lord. Thanksgiving is absolutely essential to our being willing to serve God. It's when we fail to appreciate what God has done for us that we fail to appreciate what we need to do for Him. And so much of the time, uh, we don't do what God wants us to do, don't do what He told us to do because we have lost our sense of appreciation. Romans chapter 1 talks about that, that they didn't appreciate what God had done for them, and so they turned away from God. Jonah is beginning to appreciate God. He's willing to pay his vow, recognize that he needs to serve God, and salvation is of the Lord. Okay? Other comments through verse 9. Terry. I think as you see here in Jonah's statement, salvation belongs to the Lord. At the time that Jonah is in this desperate situation and he knows his only hope is God he recognizes that God has the right to save who he wants to salvation is of the Lord he forgets that lesson in just a little while mm -hmm. and we do the same thing mm -hmm. when God rescues us from a desperate situation that we should carry with us the rest of our life we sometimes forget where we were and what God rescued us from we lose that thanksgiving for what God has done for us, and we revert back to what we did when we were in that des that got us into that desperate situation sometimes in the first place. We're so often in a situation 
when we're first converted, when we recognize what God has done for us, we appreciate his salvation. Uh, but if we don't remember that, if we don't appreciate, continue to remember and appreciate that he is our Savior, it's easy for us to no longer keep our responsibility. All right. Well, as we close then, verse 10, so the end, the fish vomits Jonah out. So the question, back to question number 20 that I mentioned at the beginning of class, how do you answer somebody who says, well, this is impossible? No man can live inside a fish for three days and three nights and be spit on, and, and he's okay. That's impossible. I just can't believe a story like that. What do you respond? How do you respond to that? What's the answer? Steve? I tell him God created that fish and he created man. I don't know how big that fish was, but if God wanted to, he could create, create a fish that would swallow up a, a cruise ship. So, you know, if it's one small man, he's going to have a problem. Okay. So, uh, Frank. We've found that all things are possible. Okay. That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? When you believe in the God of the Bible, it doesn't matter what the miracle is. You, you believe in creation? You believe in the resurrection? Well, that's what's hard about believing a fish swallowing a man. And all, all the other miracles. But when you start saying, well, I don't believe that one, and the next one is, I don't believe this one, and I don't believe that one, and pretty soon, you've just taken the whole heart out of it. The evidence for our faith. So the story of Jonah is quite believable. When you look at all the other evidence of eyewitness testimony of miracles, especially the resurrection, the creation, and so on, then it's perfectly believable what happened here. Okay, anything else before we close? All right, so we're starting chapter uh, three then next time. Thank you.